Allianz. Supporting all 32 counties through the Allianz Leagues. Hello and welcome to the Throwing Independent.ie's GA podcast in association with Allianz. I'm Will Slattery. Delighted to be back as the National Leagues resumed last weekend with Michael Verney. As always, Michael, hello. How are you, Will? How's it going? Yeah, very good. Thanks. Uh, you know, we teed it up last week about uh, how much we were looking forward to it, and I really did deliver. It was great to have some some games to, to digest and talk about today. You know, I know you were at a match over the weekend. Like, it, was it kind of a strange feeling going out in your car to an inter county game again? Yeah, no, it's it's weird. It's weird being able to like land in even ten or fifteen minutes before the match if you wanted them, being able to drive right up to the grounds. That's kind of an interesting one. Strange sitting with a mask uh, in a in a ground as well doesn't feel all that comfortable but you are in a privileged position to be able to go to these games like the you know people are people are absolutely crying out for these games and to actually be able to go to it is uh it's it's deadly to be fair because it's only when something is taken away that, that you realize kind of how much how much you miss it and it was great to have it back there was so many different subplots over the weekend from the Leitrim walk over to you know Cork making it six wins from six Dahi Waters, who was dropped from the Wexford panel earlier on in the year by Paul Galvin, recalled by Shane Roach, making his 100th appearance, 100th competitive appearance for Wexford over the weekend. Stories everywhere. Um, and it's, it's, it's just so much to digest over the weekend between Saturday and Sunday. I saw a lot of people even tweeting that they were you know, on the couch for the weekend. And in many ways, like they were glad to be on the couch to have something to watch and so many different games and so many different kind of uh, stories over the weekend. No, definitely. And I, I kind of like the way they've taken maybe a bit of a Premier League approach in the scheduling, kind of not having quite as many games all on at the same time. So as you say, you can maybe digest them a little bit more. Like we had Kerry Monaghan at 2 p.m. on a Saturday. It got its own kind of little window for people to focus on and, and to watch it if they if they could get GA go to watch it. So that was great. Um, I'm delighted now to recap the weekend with uh, Mayo legend David Brady and Conor McKeown of the Herald. Guys, thanks so much for joining us. I will. Pleasure, Will. Pleasure. And David, you must be one of the happiest men in Ireland today. GA is back now, and Mayo, what a win for them over their rivals, Galway. We've had you on many times over the last few years around Mayo Galway fixtures, and and this must be the happiest you've been after one of them for a while. Yeah, I'm all sound and no picture this morning. Um, <laughs> and you know what, Lucas? Well, I have to say to start off, regardless of the result, regardless of what way it went yesterday in a local derby, the most important thing is we were back. Um, we were back as GA people and we were back with something meaningful. We, we could do something yesterday. We could do something on Sunday, uh, on Saturday evening, was watch GA. And look, at I wasn't expecting what I what I seen and what unfolded yesterday, but it was a fantastic performance um, all round. Absolutely right. You, you know, you're going, where did it come from? It came from having a break over the last uh, seven months and players getting the opportunity to recharge their minds, bodies, and soul. But um, the younger guys coming in um, to the older boys um, right up at the top um, with, with, with Aidan O'Shea, Lee Keegan at the back, um, David Clark and goals. 15-point win. It was something I didn't, uh, I didn't envisage in any way, shape, or form in what was, um, again, for me, one of the hardest stadiums ever to play in. That's true. It was... Um, it was definitely uh, it was good. It was good to have it back, but even better to um, to walk away with a pep in my step after uh, half three. Yeah, kind of two seventeen by half time for Mayo, and it was as David said a mix between kind of some of the older players putting in good performances. Aidan O'Shea was very influential at full forward, with some of the younger, more unhealthy people. TikTok sensation Mark Moran getting one two. Tommy Conroy with three points. I know Sheen Mullen putting in a really good display as well. How impressed were you with Mayo? Oh, really impressed. Um... Like it was, it was it was two seventeen, so it was nineteen scores from twenty one scoring chances, I think. And uh, the last one that they missed was a free that was called back for an advantage. So I think Aidan O'Shea might have hit the upright, so it was nearly sort of twenty from twenty one. I mean, they were just at a different level, you know. And you know, they play with an incredible intent. You know, when a team has a lot of possession, like Mayo did on Sat or yesterday, you know, you, you tend to tend to see them sort of using the ball very carefully around the middle of the pick and tr- pitch and trying to sort of methodically pick their passes. But Mayo were just relentless. Every time they won possession, they tried to get a score off it and they tried to go directly. Their running was really strong. When they went direct to Aidan O'Shea, it was sort of thoughtful ball. And their players were just... They, they seemed to be physically at a different level to Galway. I know, that, like, you know, two weeks out from the start of the championship, that, that would be a, 
a crazy situation for us to be in. But whatever way those Mayo players used um, their time with the club, they've come out the far side of it in, in a different... Um, you know, even it's, I know it's hard to judge across different games. You know, you can only really judge two teams when they're playing each other. But from the actions that I saw, either in Parnell Park or the game of Bally Buffet or that match, Mayo looked to be just at a slightly different level to everybody else. And like, as you said, the young players, you know, I thought Oshie Mullen coming into the championship was, or coming into this year was going to be a big factor for Mayo because he's, he's, he's quick and he's young and he's aggressive. And he's a really, really tidy cornerback. And he went well in the league when he had to mark David Clifford. And he went well in the league when he was given the task of marking Conor McManus as well. So he's built for that. But uh, like Mark Moran, like where did he come from? What a performance he gave. And, you know, he plays the game in, in a way that it's hard not to kind of evoke Kieran McDonald. And again, like Tommy Conroy, he was a guy this time last year, I think a lot of Mayo people thought could be the answer to, you know, where, do we have a bit more firepower coming through? And... Geez, all the skills. He nearly scored a brilliant goal where he chip lifted the ball on the end line and he ghosted in out of two tackles and had his shot saved. Um, so like they just looked they looked to be awesome uh, yesterday. And it will just be interesting to see next week and the start of the championship whether that has more to do with Galway being miles off to the pace or Mayo being slightly ahead, like having a bit of a step on everybody else at the start. Yeah, well, because it could it could well be a case of both. You know, poor Joyce after the game didn't kind of spare the situation saying it was the most embarrassing day involved with Galway. And I think uh, it was pointed out his last game was a qualifier defeat to Antrim. So that, that kind of puts that in perspective. Uh, we were kind of talking last week in our preview about how, you know, it was great to kick off with a really high profile fixture. And it's given us a lot to talk about already with the championship only two weeks away. So maybe traditionally in the league, you could be like, ah, we were three, four or five months away from meaningful action. It's knockout one and done football from, t- from two weeks time. Yeah, uh, from Paul Joyce's point of view, any airs or graces that were about Galway after the league and how well they were going have been absolutely ripped apart now. Um, if there was any motivation lacking, which I'm sure there wasn't before this, but they really were just standing off Mayo and they were letting Mayo kick ball. Like Mark Moore, I'd say, couldn't believe the space he had. And, and Tommy Conroy and a few other, others, I'd say, couldn't believe the space they had. And even Ushie Mullen going forward, I'd say, they couldn't believe that there wasn't someone on their tail. Galway just weren't, weren't up to it. Uh, Shane Walsh, obviously not, not playing, is a, is a massive loss for them. Damien Comer now could be out as well with a, with a hamstring injury as well. And he's kind of had a an interrupted kind of last maybe 12 to 15 months. So he'd be a big loss. Galway weren't at it at all. Um, and it was funny to see the hysteria around, you know, Jim McGuinness taking a bit of a training session last week and how, you know, people are almost linking the two of those together, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, but Mayo, we're at, we're at, we're at a different level. Uh, from Galway's point of view, I'd say the, the reset button will be pressed pretty quickly. Uh, Park Jice basically took the loss on his own shoulders. I remember Liam Sheedy doing that in 2010, I think it was, 2010 or 09 with, with, uh, with Tipperary when they shipped, shipped a big defeat to Kilkenny in the league. And he took the pressure, he took the brunt, and the players were able to kind of bounce back and did a brilliant performance against Kilkenny in the league final. It was in 09, actually. So I'd imagine Joyce will do the same. They haven't become bad overnight, far from it. Uh, but from Mayo's point of view, like, could you ask for anything more than, you know, football starting back again and Mayo kind of, you know, causing the country to go into a bit of hysteria as well, just over how good they were. It was it was a it was a brilliant performance, savage performance, and the performance of the weekend. And um yeah, definitely it definitely whets the appetite for the next couple of weeks. Yeah, David, there's two things I'd like to get your opinion on regarding Mayo. One obviously is Aiden O'Shea. He's played, you know, midfield. He's even played full back for Mayo. Was, I think it was 2015 at full forward where he was extremely destructive. And then against Dublin in those two semi-final games, he was kind of stymied a bit. And they haven't really used him there since. But he was so good there yesterday. You know, is that something you'd like to them to look at as we head into the championship? Yeah, if you want to ask me one question, I, I want to uh, put one thing to bed. I don't want to hear that word hysteria used again in the next three months. <laughs> not, not, Mike, not allowed to be used. Um, <laughs> there's no hysteria. It was just a good day out. But um, yeah, look, at I, I have said it previously and I've said it before um, that when you have a target man of that ability, um, and I, I have to understand that, but I think Aiden scored more yesterday um, than he did, and I think, in 99% of his uh, last last two years of playing football um, because because uh, he was closer to the goal. Um, he, he, he gets the ball. 
But if he gets the ball within 20 yards of a goal, you're creating you're creating panic and you're creating uh, consternation from a from a backline point of view. But again, he's only as good as the ball that comes in. And I have to say, we all played a very wide game yesterday. Um, and it was again when you had the likes of Matthew Ruan um, midfield um, and Connor Loftus, who for the first time uh, I thought did very very well for himself um, as a playmaker, uh, but also as uh, co- contributing to the the overall game itself. He's look at he, he, there's nobody unmarkable, but again you have to you have to put a lot more focus if you have someone of the potential, the height, the physicality, and the ability of Aidan O'Shea and full forward. And I think um, that what is what has probably happened in other times is that that focus has moved out to the field, out around centre forward midfield. But I think t- some teams actually benefit from that because you're creating a lot more of a work rate outside or out around the third out around the mid, midfield sector, which which generates a lot of uh, turnovers or, or not the quality of ball that Mayo would have liked. But look at it. It's, it's, someone else will have a plan for Aiden uh, as full forward. But if Mayo have a fixed, and, a, a, and a, I suppose Aiden as a fulcrum, it's hard. Um, he's, it, he's very hard. He's very hard marked, full stop. And the ball goes in, um, but I liked his link play as well and his ball winning ability um, up in front. He yeah, has... He has he has a lot of abilities that will uh, cause concern to teams in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. Yeah, and the second question I wanted to ask you is: is the young forwards who played at the weekend, you know, Mark Moore and Tommy Conroy, like, do you expect them to be in the starting lineup when the championship kicks off in two weeks' time, or would maybe would, would James Hoare maybe rely on some more experienced players? Look at and 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 you have the yin and the yang, and I have to say, I thought Forrest Joyce was was a little bit unfair um, on his team that came out. Um, for the first competitive game in six months, in seven months, nearly, um, it happens. You go on. We were never in a situation like that. Neither was Porrick, and we don't know how we would have react as players. Okay, they've been training and playing. They still can play football. I go the opposite to say about the question you've asked is on, on Mark Moore and, and Tommy Conroy and the likes, and from McDonough, who's back in the team. Um, I I would I would see I would see a consistency in um, in James Horn's selection. Um, I say if they're playing well enough. And they're going well enough, regardless of the, the number of caps, age, or experience you play them. And again, it'll give them experience. Um, the first game, there's there's a game against Tyrone. The following week is then against Leitrim. Um, you'll have a fair amount of experience under your belt in three weeks and three or three games in three weeks. And I think that that'll give them a finer um, a view. Because look at, um, it's not that one swallow makes a summer. These guys had the basis of to be top class players, whether it's in the next two weeks or two years. And I think, uh, I think they add what they add is a bit of uh, of pace. We have a lot of physicality. If you look at the, look, the likes of of Killian, uh, Jermid, Aiden, um, they have a physicality. But again, that just lightning quick pace. And I suppose it's a breath of an, an enthusiasm um, when you when you come back and you have the likes of Kevin McLaughlin come back into that forward line after his. Uh, Performance in the county uh, championship winning team for not more this year. I think you ha- you have a you have a good blend, and the blend of pacey, lightning quick forwards that have an eye for goal, but they, they know that's their job. Like they're out and out, they're out and out um, scorers. And uh, what I would say is, as they know where the posts are, and that's that's a good uh, that's a good mix with to, to have the experience around them. Mm. And kind of just to take it away from the on-field action for one second, I guess. You know, as David mentioned at the start of the show, it was great to have inter-county action back to give people something to talk about and to enjoy this weekend as we're probably heading into another lockdown later today. You know, there's been a lot of debate over the last couple of days about inter-county action, whether it should proceed. You know, I know you were at Parna Park. You know, you got to maybe experience the protocols and action and stuff like that. Like, do you think it's something that should be should be going ahead over the next couple of weeks? Probably a couple of different questions to be answered there, Will. Uh, like, the first one is, like, do we want it to happen? And I think been sucked into you know trying to watch two games at the same time yesterday and watching the league Sunday last night and being at a match uh, I mean it's just you you really didn't appreciate how great these games are um, and how much they kind of they add to your day you know <laughs> just getting <laughs> watching these matches and taking them in and talking to people about them and you know so I think from that point of view there's so many people that want them to go ahead um, that there's enough 
I mean, there's no, definitely enough popular opinion to get them through the thing. There's a big question at the moment about their viability. Can they go ahead? Will we be able to get through uh, to the week before Christmas without this going to ground, without there being major outbreaks in the squad um, to continue to keep these games viable? Like, you know, like a championship without two or three of the contenders because they had experienced COVID outbreaks. I don't think that's a viable championship. So there's no definite answer to the question of whether it's actually feasible for these competitions to go ahead at the moment but I think as it stands it's the right thing to do to keep going and that I think feeds into the last question you know is it right to go ahead and play these championships when businesses are going to be closed down like that's more of a social question than anything else um, but I, I, I just I think without getting too philosophical about it um, I think a lot of people got a sort of a renewed appreciation over the weekend for how much these games kind of add to the sort of social fabric of Irish society for people who are into sport and people who are into GAA. And like the other thing from a, from a logistics point of view is after next weekend, right, these games cease to be in the control of county boards. County boards are doing a really, really good job considering most of them are primarily a volunteer sort of based organizations to, you know, understand the logistics of how you get these games to go ahead. Like in Parnell Park the other day, Dublin changed over where the gym are. Uh, gym is in Parnell Park Meath had their own area and afterwards you know there's a press conference that needs to be organised and it's it's difficult because nobody's gone through this before but I think when we get to the championship which we will do next weekend in Harling um, you know these games come under the auspices of Central Council and I think there's enough of a sort of infrastructure there with the GAA to make these games go ahead without them being under any risk of you know somebody you know just like you know with the with the frequent testing um and the proper protocols within grounds i think these games can happen um and i think credit as well to the players you know i know there was the gpa survey said there was 24 percent of players didn't want to go ahead with it but like when you go into these grounds and it's really strange to be parking outside the front door of a ground you know when at a big league match and walking into an empty stadium and and, and hearing the team talk and hearing what players are saying to each other on the pitch but once the ball gets thrown in, you kind of lose all sense of that. And, and the games become, you know, like the game game I was at a Saturday night was a good game. The game of Bally Buffet looked a good game. The Kerry Monning game looked a good game. The game in June looked a good game. So I think it's to the players' eternal credit that when the ball is thrown in, all this stuff, you know, the, the, the kind of this, the grim spectra of the whole thing going to the wall and being shut down, it doesn't seem to affect them. And I think for that reason, um, if we do get the championship and it does go towards its ends, it's going to be, it's going to be a great one, I think. Just yeah. a quick word on, just a quick word on that, Will, because um, John Hessling kind of raised a few eyebrows maybe last week when he put out a tweet and he was just asking, you know, pondering, like, when does the inter-county return badly needed in these grim days? When does that commentary end? And I think he was kind of uh, maybe a bit misunderstood, but I was chatting him on Saturday and he just kind of elaborated on it a bit more and he just said, uh, and this is kind of maybe to do with the, how more precautions are needed and people just have some worries about that. But he just said, my girlfriend is a nurse in A&E working with positive cases this week. And then I'm going out training with lads that might be a teacher in school, 30 kids, two parents. I don't need you to, or to do the multiplication, but you can see how quickly something would spread. The question needed to be asked, but I'm delighted to play. I want to play next weekend and I'll be there training on Tuesday night, hopefully, fingers crossed. The precautions were put in place. I had to get tested this week and luckily it was back negative. When you're in that position, I think people will see it, uh, see that suddenly it's a little bit different than they think. It's okay to be standing on the sideline or home watching it saying, them lads should be training, but the cases have gone up, so naturally enough, you're taking a risk. So I think, what, like, he's kind of speaking for a lot of GA people. I think the majority of players are very, very happy to go ahead, but they just want more precautions in place. And what I saw, and by all accounts, what Connor saw over the weekend was the same. I saw Westmead, uh, when they left the field, they put on masks. When they left the dressing room, they had masks come on. They, all these these little small little precautions. I was sitting in the stand, I had a mask on the whole game. I was sitting a good two or three meters away from anybody else. So I think we're doing everything we possibly can to make sure that games go ahead and go ahead very safely. But there are some worries there from players and only naturally. Yeah, and David, I know obviously over lockdown you were talking, you know, on, on the phone with a lot of people around the country to kind of help them get through it. So you'll know well, I'd say, how important something like this could be for people's spirits. Uh, you know, what's your view on it? I tell you no. Well, let me tell you this, and I can't let passion uh, come in between uh, the 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 reality. But um, the amount of texts I got yesterday from people and conversations I've had over the last four or five months to say there was I could feel the joy 
are the pure exhilaration and having GEA back. It wasn't just from my own people, it was from people right across the country that felt they had a purpose again, that felt that they had a reason for to have a time in their in their clock, whether it was seven o'clock on Saturday evening or it was two o'clock on Sunday. Um, and I, 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 I go back to say the players are the most important part of this and the public. We need, no matter what, no matter how much we love sport, we need to keep the players safe and the public and the community within the, where the players live safe. But um, I encapsulated it like this. One man was going through a cancer battle when I talked to him last April, May. He texted me yesterday, uh, yesterday even, and he said, that was like a new drug for me today. And it just, it just give, and it, we are the largest sporting organization in the world, or in, in Ireland. Not everyone is into GEA, um, but from, from a collective, and, and, and Mike is right there with, with John Heston, everyone's opinion needs to be taken into account, and the safety uh, is, 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 is a priority. A priority from a GA um, Crow Park uh, perspective. There needs to be things facilitated to make sure the players are very happy um, to play in the environments they're in. But let me tell you, whoever represented the county or put their county jersey on yesterday or will do it next week is not just representing the county. They're representing the country and they have created, they have created so much hope and they have so much, I think, just positivity. And they're not, they're not there to perform but they're there and they're doing an awful, awful service in this country right now when things um, are not, are, uh, things are bad, simple as that. But they made, they made a bad situation um, a little more brighter and a little more positive. Yeah, there's no doubting that the uh, the boost the people have received seems to be widespread, uh, judging from the response to the games the weekend, Connor. And just to maybe go back to on-field action now, you mentioned you're in Parnell Park uh, um, on Saturday night. A historic day for Dean Rock anyway. He became Dublin's all-time leading scorer. I think Stephen Cluxton, joined him in the history books as Dublin's longest serving player. But was there anything, I suppose, that jumped out to you as we kind of do get so close to the championship, Desi Files first replacing Jim Gavin? Anything of interest, anything you weren't expecting that you saw, or was it just a kind of early season fair, Dublin getting back into the swing of things? No, like it's striking how uh, familiar the Dublin team feels, not just in, in the players that are on the pitch. I think there was 10 of the, the players that started the All-Ireland final replay started on Saturday night. But in how they sort of go about doing their business, um, like at one stage in the second half, me got it back to a point and did the goal chance. Shane Walsh was very good. He just put it into the side netting. And, you know, what atmosphere there was in the ground sort of was all very much on the, you know, could this be a surprise? Could this be a shock? Could me do it? And we'd sort of, like we'd seen this movie a hundred times before and we know how it ends and you know all of a sudden Cluxon finds Brian Howard with one of these kickouts that looks like it's out of a playbook and he plays it to Niall Scully Scully wins a free Dean Rock taps it over and then Brian Fenton and Kieran Kilkenny and Conor Callan take over and Dublin kind of they kick for home and, and, and I suppose you know I suppose the surprise for me is that the team feels as familiar as it does I think had the season not been interrupted by the, the shutdown there would be a different feel about this team. I think Desi Farrell would have had longer to put his stamp on the team. Um, but he's had such limited exposure to the players. Um, and they've been so successful uh, over the last few years. I think it's only natural now that he's going back to the tried and tested. You know, like Keno Sullivan came off the bench the other night. Uh, so did uh, Owen Morton and Brian Howard. And they both started or they both started the All-Ireland Final last year. So, like, of the All-Ireland Final starting team last year, the only three players that weren't around were James McCarthy, Paul Mannion, and Jack McCaffrey, who's not going to be around. So, I suppose we kind of know what we're going to get out of Dublin, and we know that's probably going to be enough to get them to an All-Ireland semi-final. Um, and then it's just after that, whether, you know, Mayo or Tyrone or Donegal or Kerry have come up with something new or they've improved to the extent that they can actually beat Dublin this year. Um uh, but just on the Dean Rock thing again, like I know people say, well, he's playing in the modern era and there's more games and everything else. I think like it should be pointed out as well that Dean Rock didn't make his league debut till 2014. And I don't think he made his first championship start until 2015. So he's essentially overhauled Jimmy Keaveney in the space of six years. And it's a phenomenal, a phenomenal tally. Now, there's a certain amount of if you're the Dublin forward who plays closest to goal and you're the free taker, you know, you're going to, you're going to get a lot of frees and you're going to be the guy who taps in a lot of goals. Like 
you know, at the end of moves. But if you were to look at the last decade of Dublin football and draw up a list of who their best players were, Dean mightn't feature in your top five. But I think he's a bit like Keno Sullivan in that if you put together the most important Dublin players for the last five years, the guys that if you took them out of the team, um, they probably would have lost one of those one or two of those matches along the way, the games to Mayo and, and Kerry and All Ireland semi finals and finals. I think he's right up there and I think his value to this Dublin team and his importance as a footballer is probably underappreciated. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned his, his underappreciation because I guess while he maybe he hasn't had the eye catchy contributions in big games like goal, you know, hitting huge goals. If you look at his contributions from play as well as the freeze and say the 2017 final, 2016 semi final against Kerry when they made that comeback, even in the final in the replay last year, he almost always has two, three points from play in those big games as well that don't really, you know grab quite as much attention but then when you look back at the score sheet afterwards you're like oh he actually contributed a bit more than maybe you'd expected as you watched the game unfold but uh michael for dublin and desi Farrell, like what's his big challenge you think as he goes to make go for the six in a row bid taking over from jim gavin like is there a big challenge i guess using losing jack mccaffrey is one but is there is there anything jumping into you that he he'll really need to nail if they want to get that another all ireland no, I think what Connor said is interesting. He can't change too much. He doesn't really have, he's not really afforded the time to change too much. So I'd say he'll probably go with a lot of the, the tried and trusted players and probably like the tried and trusted tactics. Like he's not going to go in and be telling Stephen Cluxton to, you know, revolutionize the kick out again. They don't have time to do that. They have a system of play that works really, really well. Um, I think it was raised last night on, on Allianz League Sunday. And I think it was a good point because I, I think it was against, uh, was it against Tyrone earlier on this year as well? There'd just been little, small little bits of, of indiscipline. Uh, no, it was Clifford's, Clifford's free in the first league game this year. That free was brought up, uh, I think, 15 or 20 yards for somebody kicking the ball away. and It was brought into a scoreable position, which allowed Kerry to draw, whereas where the free was originally from, Clifford probably wouldn't have been able to score. And it happened again on Saturday night. Just even John Small was the, was the player, I think, on a couple of occasions. Just where... You know, they had a free and he was, you know, grabbing a, a mead player or running back into him or something like that. And I think Shane Walsh ended up putting over a free as a result of that the other night. Just little things like that that you just would never see uh, under Jim Gavin's reign. And it's only natural you're going to see things like that. They do have, as Connor said, though, like they will get through Leinster and they do have a bit of time just to iron out some of those small little things and... As Connor said, he's one hundred percent right. They just have to be ready for that big, probably probably a big All Ireland semi final where somebody will think they can catch them. They have a bit of time to buy, you know, that the guts of that the guts of about two months between now and then, probably about about seven weeks. So he'll have to iron out a lot of things. But that indiscipline was just just one little thing because it's uncharacteristic for them. Mm. And David, for for your view from I guess from Mayo and for the rest of the country, is there a bit of a fear factor gone now with Jim Gavin's uh, departure and obviously Jack McCaffrey as well, one of the best footballers probably of all time, uh, you know, gone out the door as well. Um, oh, let me tell you now, there's no fear factor um, diminished. The Dublin Dublin are are still the team to beat in the country. Yes, um, there, there's there's question marks we can raise, but them question marks were again raised at the start of Desi Farrell's tenure at the start of this year and they've answered every one of them up to now uh, we won't get to see a league final uh, we won't get to see the possibility of of a team dethroning them but there's it's going to be it's going to be hot and heavy over the next couple of weeks and I think a big bearing on it um, is from an injury point of view um, what injuries will come down the road because uh, if you get injured now you don't get that window that you've got in the previous history of championship where you might have four or five weeks to come back or you can look forward you can look forward and say, I look at it four or five weeks. It's nine weeks until the Ireland final. And it's, um, it's going to be a, a, a survival of the fittest, but also who can, who can, who can stay injury free. And um, with the whole, the whole way the championship is structured now. Um, and even look at from a Mead point of view, I was very, uh, look, I was impressed with their tenacity and resilience. And uh, they kept, they kept within, within um, two scores of Dublin. But the big thing was that Dublin, uh, looked very formidable. Uh, again, as the weeks goes on, they'll get stronger. But um, there's, it's. I think the level play, the the level field has been, uh, the playing field has been level now, because of the seven month break, momentum was cut from everyone, and now everyone is starting again from from uh, from the first step on the ladder, and it's going to be a, a go, it's going to be an exciting race. And look at we we all hope, um, even from look at talking to you guys this morning. Um, it's people's jobs 
it's people's livelihoods. But I think what it brought to, to people um, over the last um, three days uh, between under 20s and senior action league and I'm looking forward to the hurling next week if we can play it safe um, we can we can do a lot of good and we've got a lot of benefit out of it yeah no doubt it's been great to have uh, inter-county action back and it's great to have you back with us as well David thanks so much for joining us a pleasure guys look after yourself and stay safe yeah so guys just to finish up uh, on division one then uh, Connor you know you're Donegal Theron as well kind of a dress rehearsal for um for their championship meeting in two weeks' time. And me and Mike were talking last week whether it would be a phony war, whether the teams might be slightly weakened or, or there wouldn't be much to read from it. But it, it seemed to be a fairly full-blooded battle with, with, with a lot of to read into ahead of two weeks. What, what did you make of it? Yeah, the thing about phony wars is that, like, when you're two weeks away from the championship, okay, you mightn't, you know, you mightn't reveal your full hand. You might keep a player who's not sort of 100% fit on the bench. Or, you know, if you have sort of tactical moves that you're going to try, you might bring them out in the game. We don't know whether any of that was the case yesterday, but like it's so close to the start of the championship and, and this applies to Galway as well. Um, you know, you can't just fall flat and lose a game to a rival and then switch it on two weeks later. Like you can't do that. You know, players have to get some sort of sense of cohesion and momentum and get their competitive intensity going. So um, like I thought it was a, a kind of an interesting game. It, it, it started off in one of those very formulaic sort of ways that matches were about five or six years ago where um, both teams defended in the same way and the opposition were kind of hand-passing the ball around the outside the scoring zone. But it kind of goes to show you, and this might feed into a bit of a conversation about Kerry as well and how they defended against Monaghan. Teams are so sort of equipped now to break that down um, that you don't get these big, long, boring passages of play where teams keep the ball endlessly behind the halfway line. Teams know how to set up. They know how to stretch the opposition's um, defence when they set up zonally. They know how to punch um, scores. And I'd be worried a small bit for Tyrone just in that how they defended yesterday. Like the, the goal that they conceded, like it was an incredible goal with Pater Morgan, but there was three guys who were basically protecting the D who all bought the same sidestep and he went through and he scored the goal. Um, uh, and then the same for... Uh, Sorry, who got the Jamie Brennan's Jamie goal Brennan. as well? Like there was three players who were supposed to be protecting the D, all got taken in, attracted to the ball, and the pass came inside. And there was actually a two on one, and the one was the Tyrone goalkeeper. So, uh, like they just looked a little bit ragged at the back, um, and they'll obviously be, you know, they're gonna have a serious issue over Rory Brennan now as well, um, who looks like he's gonna get a suspension for what he did to the referee. So, um, you know, the, the the big point, big positive yesterday, obviously for Tyrone was. Uh, Connor McKenna, who was he their top scorer? One two. McCurry got one two as well, but he was definitely their top scorer from play. And I think he looked an awful lot better when he went into full forward. So I think he could probably soften the blow of the loss of Cottle McShane. Um, and you know, like a fellow of that sort of athletic ability, he's going to be very, very stop, hard to stop close to goal. But it's just defensively, I thought Tyrone looked a little bit ragged, and that's, that's not something you say about him too often. Yeah, Michael, anything jump out to you from the game? Yeah, I couldn't believe it. Uh, Conor McKenna was actually off balance when he ran into Michael Murphy at one stage, and he actually left him on the ground. Which was like that. That'll just show you. Um, that'll just show you the power he has. Um, they've they've probably stumbled upon a, a full forward. He was he was good out at centre forward and trying to spray a few passes. He sprayed a ball in for a mark. Um, a mark in the first half, a lovely diagonal ball. But he's so powerful and dynamic in at the edge of the square. If he gets a ball, he's able to set. He kind of has a good kind of dummy solo as well. He got a good goal, even though there's a half block on it. So they might have stumbled on his best position. Um, it'd be interesting to see. He, he, he might just land in there straight in full forward against Donegal in the first round of the championship. Um, from Donegal's point of view, uh, I thought they were very good at holding possession. Uh, as Connor kind of mentioned there, teams are really smart now. They don't like they don't take like stupid risks with the ball. They were recycling possession around the 65 yard line, their own 65 yard line and waiting for an opportunity to kind of, to pierce at the defense. I thought they were good as well. A couple of other things just from, from, from even been able to, that was one of the, the main matches I watched over the weekend. Uh, the water break, they've sorted out the water break from the club games. It's, it's a minute and no more. Literally a minute from the second, the referee blows the whistle to the time the action has started again. So it's not slowing down playing nearly as much as it was. And just I, I love the fact even uh, being able to hear what's going on on the pitch, whether you're at a game or even when you're watching a game, uh, you can actually, as Connor said, you can hear team talks, you can hear instructions that are coming in from the line. 
Um, it's a lot less kind of covert and maybe secretive now. You you know what you know what's going on. You can see an awful lot more. And even just over the weekend as well, not just even on the Tyrone Donegal game, but other games, we did a load of really high scoring games. Even like that would probably belie what you were going to expect for you know a winter championship or winter league. Massive, massive scores. Cork put up a huge score. It was five nineteen. Um, even the game I was at Westmead put up one eighteen. So some ma- some massive scores. I don't think that was a phony war because I don't think, as Connor said, I don't think they could afford it to be a phony war. But Mickey Hart is probably you know good and bad. He's probably lost Rory Brennan. I'd imagine. I'd say it would be the same as same suspension as what Dermot Connolly had or a similar one a couple of years ago. But he's found Connor McKenna, and I don't think anybody thought he was going to fit in as seamlessly as he has, but it looks like he has. Yeah, it's funny, just on the, uh, the talk a bit about the, you know, hearing the players, Joe Raleigh had a good description in his piece in Sunday Independent saying that Brian Fenton and Niall Scully were covering their mouths in the halfway line talking like Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci in Casino, uh, which I thought was uh, a nice description. Uh, kind of in this last game in Division 1, Kerry, I it probably won't spark uh, the kind of celebrations we saw after some of the club championships but they, if they beat uh, Donegal next weekend at home they'll be the league champions and given that Donegal have secured their Division 1 status and they're playing Tyrone the following week they mightn't go with a full strength team um, Kerry were pretty impressive against Monaghan by all accounts Gavin White put in a really good display Clifford looked very sharp while even you know I think he was dishing off a lot of passes as well he still kicked three points from play in, in a total of six points they look pretty formidable going into the championships yeah, they do. The interesting part of it was how they defended um, for most of the game, which was just any time Monaghan had the ball, Kerry filtered back behind it and set up a zone of defence. Um, so, you know, they, it's probably not what they always do. They've been able to kind of use it in patches in the past. Um, and you had like Ronan Buckley and Darren Moynihan and John O'Shea and Lee Burns. They had to put in massive shifts. They had to be, you know, bricks in the wall when they didn't have possession. And then they had to make sure that they made themselves... Uh, factors in attack when they were on the ball but it meant that it's you know I mean the, the, the beauty of defending like that is that it, it means you have to you suck in an awful lot of the opposition's players you know they have to go in and kind of occupy the zones and then they have to run the ball in and when you turn them over and you've got pace like Jason Foley and Paul Murphy and Gavin White and Tom O'Sullivan um, you know you can obviously do damage it's just going to be interesting to see whether that's a permanent thing with Kerry this year because um, like going into the All-Ireland final last year the suspicion was that they didn't have the man markers to hold the Dublin forwards. Now, in the drawn game against Dublin, they didn't get a shot off for the last 12 minutes or 14 minutes, despite the fact that Dublin were down to 14 men. And that's ultimately what cost them. But in the replay, when Dublin, um, you know, when Kieran Kenny went straight for goal, when Conor Callan, like, so, you know, man on man, Dublin's inside forwards destroyed them. So you just wonder whether this is kind of half a nod to the future that, you know, Peter Keane has, has sort of realised that if they go man on man, the Dublin forwards are going to do too much damage against their backs. And this is a, a sort of a preemptive, you know, it's, it's a stylistic change. My suspicion is that like all the best teams, the Kerry will be able to kind of employ some version of a, of a block when they defend and some version of a press. Um, and probably a couple of varieties in between as well, and to be able to turn it on and turn it off, because I think they need a bit more variation in the defence. Like, if you remember the 2018 All-Ireland Final, I think Dublin went four points to one down against Tyrone early on in that game, and for the next five minutes, they brought back 12, 13 players and just slowed down the game until they kind of got their head around what was happening, and then they you know, went and destroyed Tyrone. I would imagine that's what Peter Keane is trying to do now is just to give them that option that if they need to kind of, you know, upset the opposition's scoring momentum that they can kind of set up like that. Because, um, you know, if they do play like that, the knock-on effect is you're not going to be able to have a forward line with David Clifford and Paul Ganey and maybe James O'Donoghue or, you know, whatever, you know, you're still going to only ever have sort of two players up there. So, you know, that's the interesting thing for me with that the, the way Kerry defended was slightly different than they have done um, in the past. And because we're so close to championship, like there's no way that they were just using it to win this game. It's definitely something that they're, they're thinking about employing in a few weeks' time when the championship, cha- championship starts. Yeah, it'll be something interesting to keep an eye out for, Michael. Just maybe to finish up, we have a look at Division 2, the, the wonderful world of Division 2, where going into the final round of games, I think six teams could could get promoted. Clare could both get relegated and promoted, depending on, on which way the fixtures go. Um, you know, at the weekend, you know, Ross Common took a big step towards Division 1 with a win over Armagh. In a kind of an odd game where they, they hit them with goals kind of on the counter, where Armagh looked to be in control, and then Armagh kind of lost their head a bit and, and didn't really uh, get back into the game after that. But 
there's so much to play for, like Kildare and other team who were facing relegation potentially last weekend. Now they could get promoted this weekend. It's always the most competitive division. And while we don't know exactly what the structure will be next year with the with the tier two competition, there's still a lot to play for this weekend. Oh, massively, yeah. Like Kildare, Kildare uh, welcome Westmead next weekend. So Westmead, Westmead gave Leash uh, a right shellacking on Saturday. The Leash were totally off, totally off the pace. Westmead were seven 0 up inside the opening minutes. John Hessel ended up with four from play. Uh, Ray Canellan, former AFL star, was brilliant as well. And Kieran Martin, all the same kind of faces for them. James Dolan, brilliant in defence as well. Um, and that sets him up for a, a, an interesting tie against Kildare. Kildare like, were well on top against Cavan the whole way through. Gerard McKiernan was kind of keeping Cavan in it. And then all of a sudden, they kind of butchered a goal chance to go, to go level. And Kildare go down the pitch and end up winning by four. But Jack O'Connor probably is, is fairly happy with that. They needed, they needed something. They needed a bit of momentum. They have that now. A uh, big game against Westmead next weekend. Uh, the winner, as you say, the winner can, can be promoted. I think the loser can actually still be relegated just because it's a mad situation the, the way the points are. And just on, on the Fermanagh situation, Fermanagh are obviously down now. Uh, and Ray McMenamin has taken a, a fair few swipes um, at, I suppose, various probably suits is probably the best way to describe it. He just thinks there's a, a, a differentiation between, you know, if their situation had arose in a bigger county, maybe like a Dublin in, in football or a Kilkenny or a Tip in Hurling, he thinks that the bigger county would have been treated differently which is an interesting one. It's, it's hearsay until we until it actually happens in one of those counties. We won't know, but they're relegated now. Uh, Claire just kind of just kind of pipped them at the weekend. But yeah, real interesting games because apart from when well, Leash, Leash go to Fermanagh and you could say there's nothing to play for for Fermanagh, but they do need to kind of, you know, bring things forward a bit going into the championship. And if they win, I think, I think Leash, are, Leash are in trouble. And on the basis of what I saw on Saturday, Leash did look in a bit of trouble. So that's an interesting game, as are the, the other three. Yeah. There's something to play for in, in all of them, in fairness. Yeah, Connor. And, and are there any team in Division 2 in particular interest you heading into the last round of games or with an eye in a couple of weeks' time, you know, be it positively or negatively? Uh, Kildare were the one that I, like, I was sort of disappointed with at the start. Like, you know, at the, the part of the league that happened before it was abandoned, I, I thought they were going to give that a good, good proper rattle. Um, and... You know they perform very poorly in the last games, and at, at that stage you were thinking, right? Well, they're going to fall flat here when the championship comes around. But again, like the break has changed everything really. Like yesterday and Saturday was kind of, you know, day one for a lot of teams. Ross Common are really interesting as well, um, because you know last year I think was the first time since two thousand and one that they beat Mayo and Galway in the Connacht Championship. Um, and they have to do the same thing this year. Well, we'll probably have to do the same thing this year. Um, the Mayo or Leitrim in the, in the Connacht semi-final. Um, and I was looking at the odds for the provincial champions going into the provincial championships this year. And they're all odds on, except for Roscommon, who are 7-1 to one to win Connacht, which is like incredible sort of odds for a defending uh, provincial champion. And the lockdown has actually suited them. Um, like there was, there was a couple of players that were supposed to go away. They were missing the guts of the team through injury. Uh, and I'm not sure many of those issues would have been resolved had the championship started in May or June. So like they looked really good the other night against Armagh. They, they kind of like, I, I don't know, are there many teams that have as many attacking defenders as they do? Like you look at the players who are up the opposite end of the pitch trying to score goals and they all have, single numbers on the backs of their jerseys and they have a serious like they have the makings of one of the best forward lines in the country so like all the talk about Galway and Mayo and who's going to win Connacht okay you could say Roscommon have the hardest uh, have the hardest task but like you know they're going to be playing in Hyde Park in the in the semi-final and this morning we're talking about Mayo as potential all Ireland champions or maybe some people in Mayo were talking about them as potential all Ireland champions but I wouldn't rule Roscommon out of that game. Just yeah. on that, Connor, as well, the way Ross Common defend, like they're not going to ship a big score or anything as well. Like they're fairly, they're tight. Like they're not yeah. going to concede, you know, 20 points or, you know, 118, 119. You wouldn't imagine so because they're very solid back there. Yeah. And like they have, like, like Ross Common is one of these counties where, you know, you know, for years, people in Ross Common have been wondering, like, well, what sort of team would we have if everybody was back and everybody was fit? Because they suffer a lot from, you know, players being up in Dublin and college and emigration and players kind of, opting out of the you know opt, opting out of the panel for um you know a year or two and they lose a bit of momentum and everything else but like if you take that their forward line you could have 
like Connor Cox and Enda Smith and both Mortas and Donny Smith and Cahill Craig. Like, you, you know, okay, you have to get the balance right and it has to work as a sort of a, an organism, you know, where you have the, the right sort of elements to it. But in terms of raw talent, like that's as strong as a forward line as you get outside maybe Dublin and Kerry. So um, I just think they could be an interesting team to watch now. They're, they're effectively up. Um, I think they are a top eight team. And I think, you know, the conversation about the Connacht Championship was all focused on that game yesterday in Tune, but I just wouldn't rule Ross Common out as being a being a factor in it. Yeah, the funny thing about the Connacht Championship when you look at it is that Mayo haven't actually won it since 2015 when Aidan O'Shea was in at full four. They haven't even gotten to a final since then. It's been Ross Common Galway finals the last four years and they've gotten two titles apiece. So while we're kind of talking about Mayo as Ireland, you know, contenders, you know, getting out of their province with a provincial yeah. uh, and another thing we like since Mayo last won um since Mayo last won a Connick Championship, since Mayo were last even in a Connick final, like they've played in, uh, if you go through them, like they've played in three All Ireland finals and six All Ireland semi finals. So if those seasons for Mayo have been defined by those big sort of ticket days in Crow Park, they've also been defined by the fact that they lost the game that they shouldn't really or certainly weren't expected to lose early on in the Championship. And I suppose that's been part of their makeup, you know, being vulnerable in situations where they're not supposed to be vulnerable. And this will be the year. And I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to rain on Mayo's parade. I enjoy nothing more than the Mayo parade when they all get the flags out and uh, and get behind the team and sort of have their own sort of little inflated sense of where the team is going to go. But you know, they 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 have been vulnerable to losing games that they possibly shouldn't have lost early on in the championship. Um, and obviously, this is the season where if they do that, it's going to be fatal. Mm. And Ma- uh, Michael, just the last word for you, then maybe just quickly on the hurling league finals at the weekend. Antrim Kerry was the big one, a big win for Antrim. Uh, great for Antrim hurling. Yeah, massive win. And they lost Neil McManus after four minutes as well, which is like he's he's the, he's their key man. Um, and Shane Connor put up a big score. He hit 114 for Kerry. I was actually just chatting, chatting to Darren Gleeson before, before I jumped on this call. Um, Massive thing for them to get to the, you know, to Division One hurling because, you know, if he he was kind of just saying if he wants lads to buy in, just the fact that they're up there playing against high caliber opposition week in week out next year is a massive massive thing for them. They have to jump back and play Joe McDonough now this weekend. Another another kind of a great competition for them. And they're kind of just saying the big carrot is was of the Joe McDonough this year is the preliminary All Ireland quarter final is gone, but it is on the same day as the All Ireland Senior Hurling final. And you know, a chance at getting into a Leinster a Leinster Championship for them would be absolutely huge. So yeah, you know, a great a great weekend for Antrim. They put up a big score as well. Um, just it's something disappointing though. Like and that, it's it's the second tier of hurling. The, the league second tier and it literally got you know a parsery glance last night on the Allianz League Sunday show which I which I didn't really appreciate there was an awful lot of football on fair, fair enough but they went through Division 3 and Division 4 and gave them unbelievable coverage and yet didn't give a Division 2 uh, Hurling League final any coverage bar saying the result which I thought was uh yeah I, I don't think that's I don't think that's the right way to be promoting promoting the game really to be honest with you yeah, I suppose it'll be probably a debate going forward with so many matches being packed into such a short space of time. Uh, you know, who gets what in terms of, in terms of coverage. But for the moment, we're just glad to have Inter-County action back. Connor and Michael, thanks so much for joining me.